You're Bruce Hutchins and Steve Myers. You're tuned to Purple Haze, as always, on a Monday evening at 7.30. And joining us from the UK, where he is currently locked down, is uh, Mr. Marty Wilson-Piper from Bands, The Church, uh, All About Eve, The Saints, Noctorum, and many, many collaborations. Marty, thank you very mm. much for joining Purple Haze. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, um, what we wanted to do was concentrate on your solo career and other bands that you have been in, and uh, Noctorum's a, a fantastic band. You had a great release last year, but what I thought we'd do yeah. is um, you were born in in the UK, so I, I wanted to ask, when did you first start playing guitar and, and what inspired you to do so? Uh, well, I, I started playing the guitar when I was 14. Yep. Um, I was uh, I grew up in the northwest of England, in sort of Manchester, Liverpool. Yes, uh, so I was born in the Manchester area and lived in the sort of outskirts of uh, Manchester area in the Pennines. And then my dad changed jobs, and we moved to Derbyshire for a year, where we had a pub. Uh, he changed jobs again, and then we moved to the Wirral, which is kind of the Liverpool area. So mm-hmm. I grew up as a teenager in the Liverpool area. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, around that time, my brother, who was seven years older than me, found himself playing rhythm guitar and singing harmonies in a cabaret band. So, and he was sort of playing, playing, you know, eight, eight nights a week, um, doing, you know, going around the working men's clubs and singing things like, you know, blue Spanish eyes, <laughs> you know, yeah. songs like that. And, um, but I, you know, I mean, I, so he had a guitar and I guess that inspired me. But I mean, I was inspired to have a guitar because of the musical, uh, uh, um, my musical surroundings. I was in Liverpool, you know, mm. I mean, and having an older brother meant that he had records. And so at the early age of, you know, six or seven or eight, you know, I was listening to the Beatles and the Kinks and the Small Faces and, you know, and all those um, early, great uh, 60s bands. And then, obviously, as I turned into a 10, 11, 12-year-old, I started buying my own seven-inch singles. Yes. Um, and then started buying albums, and then I got a guitar, and then I didn't follow the cabaret, you know, the cabaret circuit. Mm. Um, I uh, started, you know, getting into Hawkins and Deep Purple and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. And that sent me off a whole other journey. But they do say, uh, I'm not quite sure who they are, but they do say that having that cabaret background is a, an interesting... Uh, an inter- I mean, the Beatles have the cabaret background. Yes. You know? And uh, uh, a couple of members of the X-Band had a couple of cabaret backgrounds as well. So, um, you know, we learned some chords that we wouldn't have learned if we'd just being in a punk rock group, for example. Sure. You know, we learned we learned we learned the chords that were in songs like Girl From Me to Nima. Mm-hmm. You know, we learned the chords that were in songs like By the Time I Get to Phoenix. Mm-hmm. You know? And they had a few kind of interesting chords in there. They were, it wasn't just A D E A D E da 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 you know. Mm-hmm. We actually learned some kind of um some, you know, um a little bit of finesse and uh a few, a few um, uh, details about how chords work and songwriting work, you know? Mm. Yeah. Marty, so, how old... So I started... So that's how I started. How old were you when you came to Australia? Mm, 21. I was a month before... I think I was two weeks before my 22nd birthday. I think I came to Australia the last week of April and my birthday's May the 7th. Wow. So that would have been quite a culture shock, too, musically, going from what you oh, experienced God, over yeah. there. Mm. Oh, God, it's the first time I've ever been on a plane. <laughs> you know, my first, my first time on a plane was London, Sydney. Yeah. Wow. But you didn't... So I remember stopping, I remember stopping uh, let me just say this, I remember stopping in Kuala Lumpur on the way, mm. and I got off the plane, and... When I got outside onto the steps down to the tarmac, 
I thought it was the heat from the engine. And then I realised it was the climate. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a bit of a shock up there, isn't it? Uh, I've never, never experienced anything like that in my life, mm. you know? Mm. So, and, and um, Australia had that same thing, you know what it's like down mm. there sometimes, mm. a lot of the time. And that whole climate thing is a huge shock to me. Mm. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's talk about, uh, in 1987, you released your first solo album called In Reflection. What memories mm-hmm. do you have from that? My my favourite song from that's uh, Velvet Fusel- Fuselage. Yeah, you psychedelic creature, you. Yes, I know. I can't <laughs> help myself. Um, yeah, well, you know, um, the uh, the in the X band, uh, the singer had a Tiac four track. Yes. So uh, it was, you know, when I first joined, uh, we were sort of like working on demos uh, on the Fiat 4 track. Um, and then, so, you know, we, we got a little bit of success. We got a little bit of money, I mean, you know, not loads of money. We got, I mean, we had a wage, you know. Mm. So I was able to buy a Fiat 4 track uh, as well. And I just started messing around with it. And I had a little six, six channel mixing desk. I just started recording things on there, and uh, um, I, I was I was I was very sort of uh, um, uh, inventive actually on that uh, little machine because you you didn't have the kind of drum machines or, or loops or things that are available these days. Mm. So I had a sort of an old fashioned drum machine that just went oh, the old doctor rhythm, you know. Like, <laughs> Yeah, like a, like a one of those rhythm box things. Mm. And um, so with those, the snare drum was never in the right place. So what I did was I um, mic'd up the Sydney Morning Herald and hit it with a drumstick, <laughs> and that's how I got the snare set. So I was quite I was quite inventive and in exploring different techniques. I don't think anybody's ever really you know used that since, mm. but. Uh, you know, so that was the first uh, experiment into uh, recording. Uh, uh, you know, work, starting to work on my own projects while I was still in the band. You know, which is which is a few years in, but you know, the band took up a lot of time in the first few years. You know, talk about playing eight days a week. Well, that's what it was like. Mm. But in Australia, mm. you played eight days a week plus every gig was a thousand miles from me to the next gig. It's so far travel to gigs there. Mm. I mean, obviously, you go to Melbourne, you go to Sydney, you go to Brisbane, and you sort of like to say we can do gigs in, in each in each city, but uh, um, I, it's just, you know, it was, it was kind of a very busy period, so it took me a while to actually get to start recording my own music. <laughs>
The uh, interesting you say about uh, early <coughs> those early days and playing eight gigs um, a week. Um, you know, I, I remember reading Duke magazine and I'd look at the gig guide and it'd be, you know, uh, models. You know, early here at the Venetian Room, and then Macy's. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, at, at eleven o'clock or something. And the, yep. one, yeah. and the amount of bands that were like, I used to go, oh my god, who am I going to go and see? There were so many great bands, and I, I think you know, when the yeah. Beatles were over in Hamburg playing, you know, seventeen or eighteen hours a day, you guys were doing the same thing, but in a but in a different way. Which mm. you know, there were so many great Australian bands, you know. It, yeah. that came from that era that, you know, went on to have yeah. success later on, either with other bands or or individually, you know. Yeah, but what happened to Mio 245? That's what I want to know. Mio 245? Yeah. I loved that band. Other yeah. Places and Lady Love. <laughs> you know, it did happen to yeah. Me. yeah. So yeah. Um, they, they uh, two of the members out of that band ended up in Little Heroes. Oh, right. And they... Mm -hmm. Uh, with the Watch the World album, which Rupert Hine produced, which was their last album, and it was fantastic. So, yes, I liked Mio yeah. 245. I've, got, I've still got, when I lived in Australia, well, you know, I've always had a big uh, uh, record collector mentality, and I've still got all those records. Oh, I've wow. got a vinyl copy of Screen Memory Screen by Memory. Mio 245. Wow. Hang on to yeah. that. It's worth <laughs> yeah. It's worth money. It's worth a lot of money on eBay. <laughs> it's a good album, too. Yeah. Sure it is, yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a, I have all those records, all vinyl copies of all those bands now. Lots of seven inch singles from that era. Yes, you know I've got lots and lots of Australian seven inch singles from that era as well. Yeah, I like Serious Young Insects. Do you remember them? Yeah, I got everything by them. Yeah, yeah. Housebreaking, <laughs> great album. Anyway, yeah. apparently it is. It's not the early '80s music show. We better digress to the Marty Wilson Piper expose. Here. Yeah. The second album. Be patient. What's Be that, patient. sir? That was the second. Right, right. Yes, yes. Um, the second album, Art Attack. I've got a funny story here. I don't know whether you remember a guy called Billy Baxter. He was in a band called The Hollow Men. Mm -hmm. And Paul, yeah, Paul be Bailey, Bailey Baxter, Baxter, that's the one. Paul Kelly wrote <laughs> yeah. a song about him. Lo and behold, yeah. so RPP is based in Mornington and Billy lives in Mornington and I knew him from when he worked at All Go Go Records in Little Collins Street yeah. with Bruce Milne. Yeah. Um, he took his dog to the park the other day and so did we and I bumped into him. And I hadn't seen him for, I don't know, 20 years. And I said that I was interviewing you and he goes... Yeah. Art Attack, what a great album. I love it. So there you go. So, so. Oh, that's lovely. What a nice thing to say. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when, when a cult hero says something good, it's even more important. There you go. Is, isn't it? The famous yeah. Billy Baxter now lives in Mornington. That's incredible, isn't it? So, um, wow, great. Now, you, uh, your lovely uh, partner, uh, wife, uh, Olivia, has, has sent through. Yeah. Uh, about 18, 19 tracks at, at, at your choice. So, rather, because it's yeah. your show. So, the song from that album that I have on my list here is You Whisper. Uh, what what was the reason for that track as opposed to the many great tracks? Uh, She's King was a, was a single, I think, from that album as well. So, why? Yeah, you, it was. Why You Whisper? Is that your favourite from that album? Well, you know, I still play that song live. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do these sort of live sessions with people as well, helping them with their songwriting. And I always try and teach them that so they so that they can uh, learn about uh, arpeggios and uh, accuracy and descending chords and melody. Um, so that's another reason. Uh, and also it's got some, some lovely flowery lyrics and a catchy melody. Uh, and some great lines in it, you know. Uh, so it just kind of typified the Art Attack album, I think, the kind of thing that I would do. You know, it was very me to sort of have that um, descending arpeggio 12 string yes. and write a sort of a poetic lyric around it. That's 
you know. So it's, it's very, very typical of of, uh, of me in that period, I think. I love that jingly jangly, you know, sound with the 12 string. And of course, you know, you've yeah. always been a big fan of the Rickenbacker. I'm going to digress just for a second. Did you have one of your guitars stolen? Oh, yeah. I had it stolen in uh, New York from the management office in the 80s. It's, uh, on my website, there's a picture of it. If you ever look at my blog, by the time you get to the end of the blog, there's always a picture of the missing guitar. Yeah. So uh, each, every day, the last, and then when it finishes the, the, the end of the uh, blog, there's a picture of my missing guitar with missing, you know. So, um, yeah. You've you got, know, you've got mean, the serial number for that? Because what we'll do at the end of the program, we're going to do a um, search and rescue mm -hmm. because um, uh, I know Eric Clapton had one of his guitars go missing, which I think he used to call Lucy. And then Peter Frampton, someone had stolen yeah, his yeah. Uh, black Gibson, which he recovered uh, years and years later. Yeah, and Jimmy Page, I think. Wow. Wow. Well, we're on a mission yeah. now here at RPFM to get your guitar back. How long ago was it taken? I think it was like 89 or something like that. Oh. It was in the late 80s in New York. The serial number is ED157. ED or EB? EB for 157. 157. Well, if anyone's got that... Um, Steve and I went to, to get you. <laughs> Steve and I went to tech schools. We're pretty tough, so you know we'll, we'll come and get them. I can fold metal. Great. <laughs> <out. Yeah. laughs> right. Now, the, th the third album was called Rhyme, and the song you've chosen there, 
Melody of Rain. What can you tell us about that one? Melody, Melody of the Rain. Yep, sorry. Um, yep. I wrote that in um, Springfield, Massachusetts, in a Howard Johnson hotel in the time of, uh, between arriving there, checking in, and going to the sound check. Mm. And um, it was uh, it's kind of green around there and, and uh, wet and rainy. And uh, I, I don't know if it was kind of a homesick song for, for, the, uh, for the drizzle of England. Um, but again, it was another sort of um, arpeggio, um, lyrical, you know, uh, uh, melodic, uh, poetic sort of lyric um, about about you know loving the rain. Mm. Um, I wrote it just very very quickly. Um, lots and lots of words, lots and lots of verses. Um, it had lots of chords in it as well, but it just kind of really sort of hangs together. Mm. And it's great when you can write a song where you think, yeah, that doesn't need drums or bass. Mm. You know, it, 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 it sort of lives on its own without mm. any extra instrumentation. You know, it just kind of, you play it, you pick up an acoustic guitar, well, an acoustic 12 string in my case, mm. you pick it up, you play it, it works. You know, you don't think, oh, it'd be great when the drums come in. <laughs> but it never, never wanted drums. It just works as an acoustic song in its own right. Like yesterday or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. you don't think, oh, yesterday, wouldn't it be great if it had drums? You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dripping down the window pane, the sky has opened up again, treating me to welcome rain. I'm glad it's here. Turns the trees to liquid green, encourages a glassy sheen upon the bark and on the leaves. It's loud and clear. Taking notes from secret cupboards, loves them. Large umbrellas, so simple and peculiar to enjoy the simple melody that hopefully won't ever go away. Splashing footsteps down the lane, puddles fill them, then remain. Sparrows grab the bathtubs, came fluff. Clean. Gray electric, moody sky, clouds so low, but if I try to touch them, I can't reach that high. Still, it seems so. I run and spin and turn and turn. I dance. What have I done to earn this day? So simple and peculiar to enjoy. The simple. Melody that hopefully won't ever go away Dry to sit me down right by the fire to read a book and be inspired. My favorite room, Mozart climbs into my head. I fell asleep, should go to bed. Music woke me from the dead. I hear you home. Come on, you enjoy my open heart. Cheat the night, run out. So simple and peculiar to enjoy the simple melody that hopefully won't ever go away. Melody of the rain. Melody of the rain. The 
Now the fourth yeah. uh, album, Spirit Level, you've got two two songs here. One's called I Can't Cry and the other one, Luscious Ghost. And we should mention this mm. is 1992 Oh, now. sorry, yes, that's right. So fourth album, 1992. So those two tracks. Uh, yeah. Are, yeah. Anything? Um, well. Yep. Yeah, well, I Can't Cry is was uh, the first one I did a project with um, a guy in Sweden called Martin Russell, who was a, that's Russell with an O and two dots okay. over the O. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, he, um, he had a bit of a solo career. He was in a, he was a, a bit of an arty uh, intellectual fellow who had a pop side. He had a band called uh, Dom Dummaster, which means the most stupid. Right. Right. Um, and he was, you know, he was a bit of a, a bit of a sort of like playful avant-garde. But he also had a pop career. Uh, he was signed to CBS, and I got to befriend him. And we got together, and we wrote a pile of songs together. We wrote like twenty songs, mm-hmm. and um, the project never ended up doing anything. I think one of the songs went on one of his solo albums. One of the songs was uh, on an EP that I put out around the same time, Spirit Level, I think it was on the Luscious Ghost EP. And one of the other songs we wrote was I Can't Cry. In fact, that's one that I wrote, but recorded with him. Right. And um, at the time, we'd been working with Bob Clearmountain, um, who's a fantastic producer, engineer, who worked on the Blue Crusade. And um, 10 years earlier, but I was still friends with him. Mm. And um, I sort of out of the blue sent him the tape of some of the songs that we'd been writing. And he got back in touch with me and he said, this song, I Can't Cry. I really like this song. Mm. Um, I wonder if uh, you'd be okay with me um, putting it forward for the new Charlie Sexton album. Oh, wow. And I went, I went what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm working on with somebody on that at the moment. And I went, sure. So... He played it to Charlie Sexton, who is now Bob Dylan's guitar player, by the way. So oh, wow. Pretty cool. uh, yeah. And uh, Charlie Sexton recorded it for his album. He had a big hit. He was this good-looking guy in a leather jacket and big cheek. I remember. Texan yeah. Yeah. yeah, Texan guitar player, great guitar player, bluesy guitar player. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, he recorded the song. And he had this big hit with Be so lonely. Oh, that's remember that right. One? Yeah, being so lonely. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. And then, so this was the second album. Right. And uh, so my song got on the second album. And it was like, yay, I'm going to have a song on a hit album. Nothing happened. That was a big failure. Uh, but uh, that's okay. And then, and then I thought, well, you know, if he's recorded my song, maybe I should record it. Mm. And um, and in actual fact, I, I I listened to a couple of things they did with the arrangement, and uh, and and took those ideas in. And uh, when we did Spirit Level, we uh, we decided to record that song for that album, mm. and that's how it came about. Um, but um, uh, the reason I included that was because it was just a little bit of a story about it. You know? If my breathing seems to Generous with sleep. If my eyes keep falling shut, it doesn't mean I've had enough. Inconsistent though I Thank you. 
Interesting um, that you mentioned that uh, you were inspired by someone else's arrangement. It's something I think we've lost yeah. a little bit in recent times. I know in the older days we used to take new songs on the road and play them a lot and work them before we took them into the studio, whereas now people just go into the yeah. studio, do a song, and then have to learn it later, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you should say that because on one of my live sessions, I was trying to help people with with their with their songwriting. One of my, when I say live sessions, one of my internet sessions that I do with people, mm. I've been trying to help them with um, uh, arrange uh, um, the concept of arrangement and structure and dynamics and mm. finesse and feel and groove and meter. And I illustrated uh, to one of my sessioneers uh, the importance of that by playing them a whole song uh, with all these things taken into consideration without actually it being a song. It had no lyrics, no melody, no chords. Uh, uh, I, I just showed them that a piece of music can be arranged mm. to be something which will, people will take notice of because some thought has gone into it or it's maybe been played live a few times, mm. you know. So the arrangement and um, and uh, working on a song dynamics is very very important to music. Mm. You can uh, you can uh, um, really make a song better by playing it a few times before you just go in there with a drum machine, exactly. play the guitar, sing it. You know, mm. you can actually really put a lot of a lot. I mean, you listen to Burt Bacharach. You try doing a cover of a Burt Bacharach song without using his arrangement. Mm. Yeah. You know, it doesn't work, yeah. It, it, has to have, it has to have that, that trumpet that goes, or, or something going, bop, bop, bop. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to have you've got to have his arrangement because the arrangement is part of it. The arrangement, the arrangement of songs is so, so important. And um, uh, what was great about being in a band that did lots of uh, gigs and toured a lot was that you got to play through the songs often before you, before you recorded them, and that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now there's uh, on um, on Luscious Ghost. Yes. Um, the reason I included Luscious Ghost was because it was just such a cracking rock song. If I do say so myself. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I mean, it's just you know, it's just got that 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 chugging thing in it, and the screaming guitar. You know, the guitar. Yeah. Screaming guitars and the. The lyrics and the it just kind of, it, 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 do you know what the cult would have probably done a great version. Of I that agree. Song yep, they, completely agree. Yeah. You know, yep. Imagine Ian Astry singing it; it'd be great. Oh yeah, it yeah. It, it builds yeah. and it's yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic. Song. Yeah. 
Between album four and five, I've got here in 1993, and I, I it was a flak file, so I couldn't play the track. But I will, Steve will be able to convert that for me. Never swallow stars. Yeah. Is that the band and the song Soldier? Or is yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's a weird one. That's a that's a recently found um, that's a recently found rarity. Right. It was a, it was it appeared and. Peer is a key to this. It appeared on a Peer Music Publishing Company Christmas CD. <laughs> You've made it. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, because I was trying to play music at the time, and they asked me for a song, I said, well, what about this? It's I've been working with. What about this one? And they gave it to them, and they liked it, and they put it on the CD. And right. then it was never, then it never came out uh, yes. anywhere else. Wow. Um, but, but, we, we rediscovered it and thought, wow, this is a great track. Um, we, we really just liked it as a song and we put it on our Bandcamp Rarities collection. Um, but Never Swallow Stars was the original name of Seeing Stars, which was the band that I formed with Andy and Mark from All About Eve when Julianne left. Right. Um, the, this 
story goes that we were working on the follow-up to um, to the fourth All About Eve album, studio album anyway, uh, which is called Ultraviolet. And um, we and Julianne, you could see that Julianne wasn't happy. Mm. And uh, she, I guess she was kind of disillusioned with music biz, disillusioned with what was happening with All About Eve. She didn't really like the songs we were writing, the backing track. She quit. And we'd sort of written all these things and we just decided to finish them off. And uh, Never Swallow Stars is what we were originally called. And um, that track was uh, just one that didn't make the album for some reason because it's great. Yeah. Um, that's where it comes from. Yeah. your fifth solo album Hanging Out in Heaven and there's a couple of tracks there Forget the Radio love the title of that and You Bring Your yeah. Love to Me yeah memories of those um, yeah well Forget the Radio um, switch on your amplifier and put a record on lay back on your pillow and hear your favourite song feel the music breathe sing the melody read the sleeve notes through what the musicians do, and if you, um, if you, was it? 
if you if you find the groove and if the lyrics do concentrate and listen very close, it was all about it was all kind of about uh, trusting your own taste rather than letting the radio dictate to you what you were supposed to listen to and like. Yeah. You know, I, I had this kind of theory, especially in those days before, you know, uh, um, um, what do you call it? Not cable, cable, cable radio, what do you call it? Uh, internet Stream, radio. Or streaming whatever, radio, you know? yeah. yeah uh, before before you had a million choices, Yeah, you know, you were stuck, stuck with, you know, in, in Sydney you were stuck with 2FM, and Triple M, you mm. know, mm. and you kind of like that was what was the commercial radio was. I mean, we got on those, so we we benefited from being on those stations. So it was all right for us. But if you wanted to hear, you know, um, you know, Pell Mell or the Lighthouse Keepers or uh, or the Trench Gashes, you know, then you weren't you, you weren't hearing them on the commercial radio station. No. And then of course Triple J was huge. And everything changed, and you know everything's changed now. But at that point, um, I was I was kind of like writing about um, how the last place I would go to listen to music would be the radio. Mm-hmm. The first place I would go to music would be my own record collection. Mm-hmm. You know. Musicians do, but when you found 
crystals that grow, the tune in the trees, the hands on the breeze. And you bring my hand left to me. You bring my hand left to me. If I had the choice of an angel's voice. single hour Then you bring your love to me You bring your love to me And we'd kiss And entwine For all time Springtime showers, your hair in the clouds, your tresses unwound. And you bring your love to me, you bring your love to me. The patterns and shapes that fall into place, the light of It shows me your face Bring your love to me. Yeah, you bring your love to me um, was kind of this. uh, I don't know. I sort of whenever I used to do it live, although it's got a band on the record, I always used to think of it as as the one man Pink Floyd show. Yep. I I used to say to the sound man, I used to say, I want to sound like Pink Floyd, even though I'm just by myself playing an acoustic guitar and singing, and there's nothing else going on. You know, Pink Floyd, of course playing, you know, mega stadiums with laser light shows and, and massive, long compositions and beautiful guitars and, you know, all the stuff that all the massiveness of Pink Floyd. But I sort of saw myself as the one-man Pink Floyd show with you bring your love to me. And I, 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 always, uh, I always enjoyed playing it. It's got this lilting beauty about it. Um, and uh, these days, I can't actually reach for high notes anymore. Um so we sing it low and have Olivia. We sort of do it together, and she sings the high notes, and I sing the low notes. But it still works live. It's just a beautiful, lilting, melodic, you know, piece of music. I think, and people kind of like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, now, I jumped the gun before, and we can edit that out too. What I've just said, Steve. But um, <laughs> and, and, and you, you released a an album under the name Noctorum with your friend Andy Dare Mason. How, how did all that come together? And uh, the first album was 2003, and uh, you've got a song on there, High as a Kite. But tell us about Noctorum. Uh, well, um, not, not so, yeah, well, okay. Well, um, Dare, as you call them these days, uh, is my oldest friend. Yes. Our parents were and we have known each other since we were, we're not quite sure when we first met, 
but I think I was about six and he was about seven. Wow. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So we've known each other like for decades. And uh, our parents were friends. My mum was his dad's secretary. Wow. And uh, his dad worked for uh, the Royal Automobile Club, RAC, which is a recovery, um, I guess, like you have in Australia. I can't remember what it's called in Australia. Oh, it's all uh, different. There's NRMA in New South Wales and, and the uh, RACV uh, in, Mel- in Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, well, it's like the NRMA. That's what he, that, he was like boss of the NRMA in, in England. Yeah. My dad was a, a road safety officer in Liverpool. So they wow. worked together closely and... Um, uh, and um, um, when I, I lived in Derbyshire, my dad got this job and moved uh, to the Liverpool area. And we moved within spitting distance of where the, the family, their family lived. And so we sort of uh, continued our friendship. We never went to the same school, but we sort of knew each other because of our parents. And we got along and he had a younger brother. I was in the middle. He had his brother. His brother's like two years younger. He's one year older. So we all kind of hung out and stuff. And then we started discovering music, you know. And we, we had a band together in the seventies, um, a couple of different things. Um, and um, so, you know, I could tell you, I could honestly talk to you for three hours about my relationship with Dare on a musical level. Well, maybe that's a, a maybe that's a second show. <laughs> yeah, that's a second show. Yeah, but uh, to jump from 1969 to 2003, yep. <laughs> uh, we uh, at some point decided to get together and um, uh, make, write some songs. He'd been helping me with solo albums. He'd been engineering. He did a he did an engineering course in Sydney. He lived in Sydney for a while too. Yeah. And uh, he uh, ended up being a pretty hot engineer producer. Mm-hmm. And... Um, we he'd worked on on some of my solo albums. You know he's on um, Art Attack, uh, In Reflection, Art Attack, uh, Rhyme, Spirit Level. He's on all of those records, mm. working with me as, as generally the engineer mm. and co-producer. Uh, so by the time we got, as I say, jumping forward to 2003, that was the time when we decided that uh, well, hey, why don't we just kind of like do something where we we write the songs together and just work on a project together instead of me writing the songs and you being the engineer. Mm. And um, Doctorum is what we came up with. Uh, and, um, you know, he, uh, that record is actually recorded. The first one, which is called The Park Lane, that, that record was recorded very quickly uh, as far as all the songs that were right, written and all my guitars and bass and singing. Mm. But um, put it together over a period of time while I was away on tour. And uh, you mentioned High as a Kite, the song High as a Kite before. Yes. That was a um, pop-tastic track from that album, um, which we always say was the uh, was the hit that was, was never a hit because we released it 15 years or 25 years too late. <laughs> but if we sort of it sometime between 1968 and 1975 probably would have gotten some charts somewhere yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't mean that I lost the feeling that just wound up sitting in the car then I went home and stared up at the ceiling As I look out the window There's people with umbrellas in the street But through the dark the sun is almost shining 
2006 called Off the Light and a song called Hopes yeah. and Fears. Yeah. Hopes and Fears. I stare out of my window at a grey northern sky on a Saturday and the smoke in the distance that clings to the hills from the factories and people are gathering in droves in the street because it's market day and I'm in love with a girl that I met on a yesterday. Wow. Yeah. Love it. That, you know, that was a sort of a fantasy northern, um, fantasy northern, I don't know what it was inspired by, but I, I just sort of like, I just sort of got into this headspace of, 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 of a, a couple living in, uh, the, the, the bucolic pulchritude, one of my favorite phrases. The bucolic pulchritude of the northern English hills, the living in, working in factories, but outside of those, those smoke ridden, um, um, devilish mills with all this beauty and, uh, all the hopes and despairs they had in their lives about, um, hopes and fears and despair and, and, uh, wishes that they had in their lives. And I just kind of like wrote this whole thing about these people. 
and it just turned into a really nice song, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's one of the songs we do live always, and uh, it, it, people really like it. And Olivia plays a uh, violin on that and did a great mm-hmm. violin solo at the end. We usually finish the set with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just uh, as far as my work as a songwriter, that's one of the songs I'm most proud of. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's melody, it's chords, it's lyrics, it's subject matter, mm. and how it just kind of came across. Yeah. I stare out of my window at a grey northern sky on a Saturday. And the smoke in the distance that clings to the hills from the factories And people are gathering in droves in the street cause it's market day And I am in love with a girl who I met only yesterday Summer has gone, lights are on The nights have grown long Then the town's looking down As the rain hits the ground Then the newspaper sellers are telling us all what's been happening And women are hiding in shopkeepers' doorways and gossiping In the cafe across from the hospital And finding a cure for the love lord Is proving impossible Life tumbles on like this song And the music plays on And we kiss like a play With the love on this place
Now, your sixth solo album was called Night Jar. That was released in uh, 2008. Uh, and a song yeah. and a song called More Is Less. Yeah. More Is Less. Yeah. That's the song that people pick out. They like. They usually pick out More Is Less and The Sniper, the two songs that people like from that record. And uh, the, the funny thing about More Is Less is, is that I, I never kind of figured out how to play it. I, I kind of tuned the guitar to some weird key and just started doing this finger-picking thing. I never actually... I can never kind of quite figure out how I did it. So it seems like a song I could do live, but I haven't quite figured out how to do it. 20 years later, I mean, 12, 12 years later, I still haven't figured out how to play it. Uh, but I got it together the day I recorded it. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, it's just a, a great uh, arpeggio, isn't it? You know, indeed, again, indeed. It's, me doing arpeggios, you know. Yeah. But it's a six-string arpeggio with a weird tuning. Mm. That's why it sort of sounds like that, mm. yeah. It's funny, you know, uh, there's been a couple of occasions in the past where I've gone into recording sessions and we've done something and then later on we've looked back and we went, how, how did we do that? <laughs> it's like you forget or something. It's like it's like you're so in the moment that you're not recording it, you know, in your mind. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I always felt I always felt that uh, like that with um, I did something on a couple of ex-band songs. Uh, I think one was Columbus. Yeah. Uh, on Heyday. Yeah. I never, I never kind of quite remembered how I did it. Uh, I remember the first part, you know, and then it goes to there's a section in there which I never quite remember how I did it. Yeah. I never quite got it right. So taking it up. Uh, but the funny thing is about the, about those songs. The original way you did it, it's usually something very simple. Mm. And just to, just just when you change something around a bit, it makes a big difference. That's why music is amazing. Because, mm. you know, people write songs with the same chords, and yet somehow they're quite different. I mean, if you take Twist and Shout uh, and uh, uh, Wild Thing, you know, they're, they're just a Louie Louie. You know, they're all the same chords, but they're quite different, different uh, classics, aren't yeah, they? You yeah. know, and, and uh, you know, but but it's just because somebody's just done something a little bit different in it. Well, if it's your own song, mm. you, you you know that little different, that little tricky little thing you did, which was kind of obvious but you hadn't noticed before. That's what makes a great guitar part. You know, mm. it's like reptile. I you know when I wrote the reptile riff, I just picked up the guitar and played the whole thing yeah. without even thinking about it. And the rest of the band looked at me and went, what's that? <laughs> I, went, I don't know. Just made it up. You know. Love it. And, it's all and, about and the that, execution. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just, I said, I don't know, I just made it up. Yeah. And it, it, and it suddenly became this really important thing that the band did, you know. Mm. Interesting. Fantastic. <laughs>
I suppose we're clever We build and we create But we're a badly designed machine Uncontrolled And trusting as a snake Yet loving, kind and serene There's something unnoticed In every walk of life and no policy Distinguished peasants and lovable rogues We are bent to disagree I don't feel safe in my heart Next project, um, sp- uh, spelt M O A A T. So, is that moat or moat or what, how do you pronounce that? Moat, as in moat. you know. As oh, in a moat, as in a moat a, around a yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. That was um, my my, my uh, technical school education's let me down there. <laughs> right. You obviously weren't around in seventeen fifty six. Uh, no, but my my uh, great 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 grandfather was one. Of, one of them was from Shoreditch uh, and stole a coat in eighteen forty two, and ended up in Van Diemen's oh. Land. And that's a true story. Uh, wow! Really? <laughs> yeah, yes. Wow. He escaped yeah. to the mainland, wow. though. Yeah. Uh, that's how I ended up here. Cl- clearly, there were no sharks <laughs> that night when he. Was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell us yeah. about well, well, tell us about Moat. Well, moat, um, moat is an interesting thing because that I have a friend. One of my when I moved to Stockholm, um, you know, I have a daughter and a granddaughter in Stockholm, and uh, so I lived there for a few years. And um, when I moved there, one of the first people I met was a guy called Inge Kramp, mm-hmm. and uh, he's about nine years older than me. But um, he's a he's a he's a bass player and a and a sound engineer, and um, he's a lovely, mellow, warm, super cool guy. Plays in a a very cool progressive band from the early seventies these days, and uh, he's uh, he's just he's just a great guy. And he had a few musical connections. One of them was with um, this this other person. This other musician called Nico Relke. And don't ask me how to spell that because it's kind of complicated. <laughs> just jumble up the alphabet um, and there you go. Yeah, just throw some letters in the air. That's how you spell his name. <laughs> uh, and he said he had, he, Nico 
was friends with Sigur, and I was friends with Sigur. And Sigur one day came up to me and said, you know what, I've got this friend, and I think that you would do really good stuff together if you worked with him. And he went up to Nico and said, you know, I've got this friend, mm. and I think you two would do some good stuff together if you worked together. So we, um, uh, we were like a blind date, you know, we were put together, and... Uh, we uh, sort of hit it off and started writing songs together. And, that's, and, and the thing about Nico is he doesn't sing or, or write lyrics. Right. But he's a great poser. He's a multi-instrumentalist. He plays bass, guitar, pedal steel, piano accordion, piano, uh, and um, I don't know, probably something else as well. <laughs> so he, he's, um, he's, he's, a, he's a multi-instrumentalist. He's worked a lot with... Um, uh, composing for film and ballet, uh, the, uh, for theatre and uh, for TV series and stuff. And uh, he also played in a kind of quite well-known Swedish band called Weeping Willow. They're quite a big band over there. And wow. He plays guitar and keyboard in that band. And um, he, um, so the thing was, he had all these, all these things he's written for sections of theatre or part of... Um, TV shows, he'd come up with some little moody little piece, and it would be played for 15 seconds, mm. and then it would be forgotten ever, you know. Mm. And what we came up with was that some great little ideas there, which could be developed into songs in their own right. So we we took some of those things and turned them into real songs, you know. He, he might have actually written the chords and the riff and, and, and even the melody, and I'd take it away and... Uh, write words for it and uh, maybe help with the arrangement work, of, work out another part and we'd have a song other songs I sort of write 90% of it and he'd come in and add to it and then we wrote some songs just together where we'd sit opposite each other and write some songs yeah. the, the other thing about him was was that he was um, he was um, pretty good in in, uh, in studio knowledge and recording things so we did some demos and uh, yeah, that actually ended up turning into the first Mo album, and we've just completed the second Mo album, um, which uh, we've released a couple of songs from, um, uh, which will be out early next year. So we continued the relationship in from then to now, and have another album available soon. Yeah. So the song from Moody. The... Go ahead. It's, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of moody, sort of. I don't know. Scandinavian, folky, moody, uh, kind of eclectic as well, yeah. mixture of things. Um, and the song from that was what? what which song? Did try you and make sense from that one. Try and make sense. Uh, yeah, tr try and make sense was from uh, a um, a TV show. That was the closing theme song for a Swedish detective story. Right. Um, whose name escapes me at the moment. Okay. Uh, Arna Dahl, it was called. It was Arna Dahl, and uh, that was the closing track. Yeah, so that that has a connection. That's why that song is the way it is, because it was for something else, but we put it on that record because we wrote it together. Try and make sense 
of the one hand following track is it looks like a different project here Atlantium Flood oh yeah Atlantium Flood okay so yeah so Note is the second Note album is later in the chronology yeah, that's correct yeah um, uh, but the um, so Atlantium Flood is um, Atlantium Flood's a funny one because that's an instrumental album okay um, and I've never made an instrumental album before. Mm. Um, I've had a couple of instrumental tracks. There's one or two on the X Band albums. There's one or two on the solo records. But this was a, 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 a project. We had somebody in the studio here who was friends with uh, Dare and his, and his brother who was coming down to work on some stuff and um, into the studio. And I just happened to be here at that time. Mm. And... Um, put the head around the door and said to me, hey, Martin, do you want to come and play a lead solo on this? And um, I, I went, yeah, sure. So they played me the track. I went in there and I did I did something and they all kind of went, whoa, that's really great. That's perfect. And then it seemed kind of obvious that I should be, you know, the guitar player on this project. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up, uh, I ended up playing, um, 
I ended up playing on the whole album and, and being the sort of the, the moody lead guitar player on the whole record. Mm. Um, and Olivia plays on it as well. She plays violin on it. Wow. Uh, and, uh, it just uh, it just turned into a, a really cool instrumental record, which uh, which I really like actually. I still put it on and go, oh yeah, that's good. I don't, don't listen to my own records very much, but that one I kind of might put on more more often than the others. Yeah, because it's because it's instrumental, it's kind of moody. Mm. Yeah, people like it. Everybody that's heard that record really likes it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, is that available for download? That album uh, on, on I iTunes. Suppose, I suppose it is. Yeah, uh, I'll investigate I'll that. that. I'll investigate. Yeah, that. I suppose it is. It must be. It must be available on all the usual outlets. I would say. Yeah, but if you can't ever find it, you just get in touch with Olivia and she'll tell you where to get it. Now, uh, last year you had another 
Noctorum album, uh, yeah. which I bought. It's got one of the best album covers ever. I love that front cover yeah. with the space helmet on it. Two fantastic yeah. songs. I sent that album, by the way, to a guy that had a number one in America called Jesse's Girl. Um, and he used to be in a band called Zoot that were pretty cool, did a heavy version yeah, of... With Frink, with yeah, yeah, yeah. And he loves that album, thinks it's absolute... Oh, really? Yeah, 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 he's right into that. So um, uh, he's um, he's actually, he's a, he's a bit of a fan of yours, Marty, so there you go. Um, oh, great. Yeah, but a couple of great tracks on there. Um, yeah. And two that you selected, um, the, the opening track... Um, the moon drips. Is that flugelhorn that you've got playing there, or is it trumpet? Or it's sounds, what? It, is that a flugelhorn in the, in the start of that track? It's it's or just a trumpet. It's a, a stunning track. Yeah, it's actually it's funny. It starts off. Everybody says this. I don't know what it is, but it it's actually violin at first. Is that right? And then. Yeah, and then trumpet comes in. Trumpet, sorry, yes, trumpet. Okay. After the after the first chorus, I suppose, or was it? I don't know. It comes in at the next instrumental break, anyway. It's trumpet, and for some reason, the violin seems maybe it's just the part or the sound. I don't know. When the trumpet comes in, people immediately, when they hear it again, think that the whole thing is trumpet or some kind of brass. How long but it's that? actually violin. Wow. At the beginning, then and then uh, trumpet later, and then a bit of both. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a super moody track. Um, it's kind of like um, Bohemia 1866 <laughs> transported <laughs> to the Texas, Texan, Mexico border of yeah, very much. Yeah. You know, mm. and uh, it's uh, it's kind of um, vamp- vampire esque. Yeah. Uh, Indeed. By a, by uh, by a Mexican bandit. Yeah, and and, and <laughs> you know, the, but, uh, yeah. it's strong. It's a great track. Love it. Yeah, very moody. Uh, yeah, and that section is that section in the middle where it sort of goes to kind of hard to explain yeah, what it is, yeah, but it's yeah. the way uh-huh. that what it is. That section in the middle really sounds like you know Count Dracula's castle is. Uh, Appearing, you know, <laughs> uh, on the hillside Through the mist. Uh, with the moon, you yeah. know, it's really evocative.
Um, this, the, the other track that you've selected from this album uh, is Dancing with Death. What can you tell Dancing us about that? Death. Mm. that? Yeah, that's actually not on the album. Ah, that EP. Is, it's on the EP. After Death EP. Yeah, My apologies. The, that's on the After Death EP. Yes. Um, which was a, a later a, a later release. Um, and uh, the reason that that track isn't on the album is because we, we had another track on there, um, uh, a girl called A Girl With No Love, which I kind of felt they were sort of covering the same kind of ground. Got it. So, All Love Dancing With Death is a really cool track. I, I just felt like it, it sort of didn't balance the record out properly. And there's a funny thing about making albums. I don't know, these days when people are just listening to tracks, one song or half a track before they get bored. You know, there's a there's a whole art to sequencing an album, mm -hmm. and um, um, the uh, dancing with death, I just couldn't fit it in the sequence, mm -hmm. and so it didn't it didn't get on the Afterlife album. But then when the After Death EP came out, uh, we put it on there, and you know, so it was great to have that extra track for that EP. Yeah. It does make sense because you know. When when we were much younger and you'd buy an album, you'd play side one and listen to it and flip it yeah. over and play side two. And what's happened today, particularly with younger kids, they, their attention span is so short and because of when, it, when CD was introduced and now you've got, you know, Spotify and so forth, it's just like, oh, yeah. next, uh, next, next, uh, whereas you, you don't have that. And you know albums of of uh, you know a bygone era, um, even though there's you know amazing albums coming out today. But you right on the money with that whole track order because mm -hmm. it becomes a concept piece and it all makes sense in that yeah. particular running order. It does. Yeah, it's almost you know, last art sequencing an album. You mm -hmm. know. Mm. Yeah, it is. It really has to be really has to be right. Getting a sequence right is really is a really important thing. Yeah. Um, well, was a really important thing, you know. Oh, it still um, is for some people. Yeah. yeah.
a good time to talk about the archive, the Deep Music Archive. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, okay. Well, um, the In Deep Music Archive uh, is um, it's basically my, my record collection, but uh, it's kind of more than a record collection. It's kind of grown to having 50,000 records. Wow. And um, it's, uh, it's vinyl, it's 12-inch singles, it's 7-inch singles. It's 78, it's CDs, it's cassettes, it's classical music, it's punk, it's, it's progressive rock, it's reggae, it's punk, it's soul, it's easy listening, it's, you know, it's 40s music, it, it, it's soundtracks, it's film, uh, it's um, shows, it's comedy, it's, uh, you know, you name it, it's, uh, it's dance music, it's rap, R and B, it's jazz funk, it's jazz, it's blues. It's a huge collection of all different genres. And um uh you know, I'm a record nerd. And um, <laughs> aren't we all? <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> and uh I uh I write about the 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 vinyl the, the not the vinyl, I write I write about music all the time. And, um, and my, my dream is to turn it into a some kind of culture center mm. where people can come and, you know, in my, in my dream world, it, there's a building somewhere, anywhere, <laughs> uh, with public access that has all the records, all the CDs, all the singles, everything in alphabetical order, as the decor um, and people playing the record, a little stage in the corner for bands to play. Mm. Uh, and, you know, there's a crash upstairs and the yoga section and uh, a cappuccino machine and internet available. And, uh, all, you know, also I've got tons of encyclopedias about music, lots of biographies about music. Uh, and also I've got all my guitars, all my amps, uh, all the records that I've made, and uh, in my dream world, as I'm being sent off in my coffin to my grave, <laughs> I'm I'm looking back through the little window at the end of my coffin and seeing the indie music archive, the ribbon being cut as it's opened for <laughs> the it. world. To, and 
So where is the collection yeah. housed now, Marty? It's in Penzance in Cornwall. Right. Uh, it's part of the it's part of the uh, studio we have here, VIP Lounge Studio, and the Indian Music Archives are all in the same premises. The studio kind of room is next door, and the live room is over there. And uh, you know, this is a, this is the space that we're in at the moment. It's just um, yeah, we're surrounded. This is another thing about being trapped in England. We're not only trapped in a, uh, a recording studio. We're also trapped in a record archive, which wow. is kind of cool. Yeah, it is cool, actually. <laughs> a good place to be trapped, actually. <laughs> now, yeah. And I'm buying, I'm buying records all the time. Yeah. The records arriving here. I've just got Nick Mason's Source of Full of Secrets album just oh, arrived. Wow. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that's coming through the post. I just got PJ Harvey's All About Eve soundtrack and the To Bring You My Love demo. It's got Laura Marling's new album. It's got Phoebe Bridges' new album. It's got Jonathan Wilson's new album. There's lots of new records coming as well as, you know, older ones and reissues and stuff all the time. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, we've got four new tracks here, and um, and two of them are from the upcoming Moat album. Are we, are we able to play those two tracks, um, Marty? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah good, yeah. good. Okay, yeah. so... So one of them's called Acid Rain. Yeah. What can you tell us about that well, one? Well, yeah, gone by, gone by, yeah, it's, okay. What's happened is they've, they've come out in, in order. Gone by Noon first and then Acid Rain. Okay. Gone by Noon, I'll tell you about Gone by first because that came out first. Okay. Um, gone by Noon was just a track that we, you know, we've got this record, the second Moat album. It's, it's quite eclectic. Um, and, and, you know, we're always trying to, you know, I was trying to pick, I was trying to pick something that makes sense to, to, on an overall level. It's really hard. It's like I always say, how come the Beatles were allowed to make such a eclectic record, and nobody ever said, "Oh, good," you know? <laughs> how can they have Revolution Number no. Nine and Julia on the same record? Yeah, you know. But, I mean, sure, people would complain about the occasional. McCartney song they didn't like, but mm. you know, give him a break. He wrote a lot better songs than you did. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, but um, you know, it's like eclectic. Uh, I always like the eclectic records, and when I listen to the White Album, I'm I'm not missing out tracks. I'm going, wow, it's amazing how it goes from that extreme to mm. that extreme, and it's all on the same record. Mm. So um, on the Moat record, we put out Gone by Noon, which is kind of a moody. Sort of, um, uh, people say J- James Bondy. It's kind of got this James Bondy feel about it, you know, yes. like that. It could almost be a, a theme, a Bond theme tune. Uh, so um, we put that record out first, that song out first, just as a taster, and uh, people really liked it.
dice playing cards mirrored in the roof you cheat with the best when you're caught you're aloof and avalanche that seals a silent shroud the noise has gone An empty shell album, uh, quite different up tempo um, I think calling the song Acid Rain is probably very appropriate mm. these days isn't it? <laughs> I think so <laughs> I think so <laughs>
project and an album coming out next year and the band called Space Summit and the album Life is the Way. What can you tell us about that project? Life, life this way. Yes. Uh, life this way, yeah. Um, the album's Life This well, Way and you've got two songs, I'm Electric and, oh, and Life This Way, yes. Yeah, like, yeah, the title track and I'm Electric. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, this is an interesting thing. This is... Uh, I have this thing called, I've, I've touched on it before, I have this thing called Songwriter and Guitar Guidance Session. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, uh, people are able to get in touch with me. Uh, and I, I just thought, look, I've made 75 albums. Wow. I've been the bass player, the singer, the guitarist, the producer, the, you know, the, even the drummer sometimes. Mm. Uh, the songwriter, the harmony guy, the, the rain, you know, I sort of been through a lot of uh, I've got a lot of experience in making records mm. and um, I I, um, I kind of felt like I should give something back you know and when I was a kid I, I've always been interested in languages which is interesting being married to a multilingual like Olivia um, so uh, I, w- I was uh, wanted to I actually wanted to be a language teacher wow. I mean I had to learn a language first, but I wanted to be a language teacher before I could even speak a language. Mm. So now, later, here we are, um, uh, you know, and we, we have languages in our lives because of my Swedish connection. I'm actually studying French at the moment. Olivia's studying Portuguese. She's fluent in three languages, wow. and we'll be in four or five by the time she's, you know, 35. Mm. Um, uh, but, so the, what happened was that all this made me think, you know, teaching, 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 teaching. I'd actually like to help people with their music and their songs. Mm. You know, and instead of getting, instead of just being asked to produce records by people who are established, I thought it might be nice to help people who didn't have anything going on, but a whole lot of ideas, and seeing if I could help them develop into doing something. Mm. And the plan worked, wow. believe it or not. Wow. The plan actually worked. When I met Jed, he was the first person who ever got in touch with me in Jed's in Minneapolis. And Jed was kind of like, you know, he was kind of keen and, I, you know, I don't know. He was, I was teaching him to count in and, you know, and sing in tune and, you know, play in time and all these things. So, you know, he was not because he didn't have the skills. Uh, to learn these things, but because nobody had ever, nobody had ever in a professional way had ever taught him anything. Yeah. You know, nobody had ever showed him all these things. It's like all these things that we take for granted as professional musicians. It's not that obvious for everybody, you know. Mm. You know, a lot of people haven't, you know, they got jobs, they worked their lives, they got married, they had kids, whatever it is. They didn't sort of get into a situation where they're doing eight gigs a week, making albums and working with Bob Clear and Aaron, you know. But it, but it doesn't mean to say that, they, that these people don't have any good ideas. So Jed and I worked together for a while. I helped him a lot with, with his, um, with his uh, you know, with his playing and his, uh, his ideas. And then at one point I said to him, listen, Jed, why don't I, I got an idea. I'll send you, I'll write you some chords and you go away and turn it into something. I'll give you, I'll, you know, and I sat there right there and then on Skype and played him something. I just made something up and and gave it to him. Like, a couple of weeks later, he got back to me and said, this is what I've done. And he played it to me and it was amazing. <laughs> you know? Wow. It was like, wow! What is that? Where did <laughs> that come from? You know? <laughs> and uh, he's, a, he's an English major, so he writes really good lyrics. He's really good with lyrics. He's got this kind of sort of breathy voice uh, and uh, it's kind of like dream poppy sort of thing but mm. with me playing guitar and bass I play all the guitars and all the bass on it uh, but we ended up doing it with 10 songs I co-wrote all the songs he wrote all the lyrics and uh, we we actually made the record you're going to love this I, I hope this is interesting to the listeners um, Jed lives in Minneapolis and he was doing something online, and he, he came across a backing singer 
who lives in Borneo, right? Wow. And uh, we have a we have a drummer who lives in Bristol. So Jed did the demos in Minneapolis, sent them to Borneo, where the backing singer put her voice on. Yeah. Then we sent those to Ed in Bristol, where he put the drums on. And then they sent it to us here in Penzance, uh, where they engineered it and co-produced it. And I put all the guitars and the bass on, and then we mixed it here. Wow. So we made this record in all these different countries in these obscure parts of the world, and um, ended up with this record, Life This Way, and, and I'm a lecture for two of the songs from it. And it just turned out great. I think people are going to really, really like it. And the story about how it came about is just really, really uh, inspiring, you know, mm. because it just goes to show what you can do with helping somebody out, putting yeah. some effort in, them having them having self discipline, them putting the effort in, you know, believing in in each other's talent and skills and that ability to collaborate, and uh, and then you know I, I had to go to there and say, well. Jay would be interested in working on this project because, you know, you've got to like it too. He was really into it. The drummer was really into it. And uh, we ended up making a really cool record, and that's going to be out on the same label as uh, my solo record and nocturnal record, School Kids record, uh, hopefully in the middle of next year. I mean, and it would be out earlier. But, you know, there's a queue. There's a queue of records that I've been making to, to put out. You know, it's just a queue. Yeah. <laughs>
title track is a bit Beatlesque from uh, from listening to it a couple of yeah. times. It's a fantastic it, track. It's catchy. Isn't it? Yeah, very, isn't very it much. So. Um, it's great though. It's got yeah. such great mood to it. Well, we'll 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 uh, we'll be playing it when it comes out here on Art of Will PFM for sure. Yeah, great. Well, look, Marty, we'll we'll leave things there. We've, believe it or not, we've been chatting for an hour and nineteen minutes. But uh, as I said, Steve will do some editing, and it looks like it'll end up being a three-hour show, which is not a bad thing because David Sterry got three hours as well. Yeah, um, there's, um, there's another couple of projects you haven't mentioned. Ooh, where, though, like where? please, please, sorry, uh, that's all, that's what yeah, I've, well, I've go go right ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I play guitar with a Swedish progressive rock band called Anecdoten. Oh, you, you do? Know about do. That? Yeah, yes, I saw that in your Wikipedia notes, yes. Yeah. Um, Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, well, Anecdoten has been together for 25 years. Wow. And um, they, they, started, they started off playing Tim Crimson covers and then became a sort of a, a wrote, started writing their own song. And then um, uh, when I moved to Stockholm after I left the X band, uh, I started, I got to meet Niklas, who's the guitarist and main writer in the band. And um, he, uh, he, uh, he actually was a fan of my work with All About Eve. Okay. He, uh, I, made a rec- I made a record with All About Eve called Ultraviolet. Yes. Um, which is a, a super cool All About Eve record. The, the worst selling one, but, uh, you know, one might argue the best one. <laughs> well, depends on. And what you, you know, but, um, uh, so he asked me to come and he knew I did some 12 string stuff. He knew my work from the X band and all about it. And he asked me to come and play on a track. And that track ended up being the title track on the last album, which is called, uh, until all the ghosts are gone. So I played on that track and then they asked me to play with them live. And, um, before I knew it, I was in Tokyo in Japan hmm. playing guitar with Anecdoten hmm. in a kind of a big sold out show because they're kind of a super hip band in certain parts of the world. Like, they're sort of like big in Italy, big in Poland, big in, uh, big in Japan and uh, all these kind of strange places. Hmm. So I ended up anyway being part of the band. And uh, funnily enough, that's how I met Olivia wow. because um, we played a festival in Germany and Olivia was the host, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, four and a half years later, you know, we're married and together every minute of the day, and that was because of anecdote. Wow! Uh, but it's a great band. It's a really, you know, talk about. You think somebody like me would sort of join the band and be able to sort of slot in and learn the songs? I'm telling you, it took me months to learn the set. Wow. It's like really tricky, tricky songs with weird timings and if you don't use the right fingers on the guitar next you can't get to the next part it's it's really it's really it's really tricky but the guitarist and i uh, we have a great compatibility musically we sort of our guitars really we just kind of work together really well with the guitar sounds and the, the weaving and the intermingling of the guitars so that turned into a super cool project we were doing gigs this year uh in poland we were doing gigs this year in uh, Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmo. Mm. We were doing gigs this year in Canada and uh, Montreal, uh, all cancelled, you know, because yeah. of the COVID thing. Mm. Yeah. So that project is a really great thing, uh, a, bit, uh, a real challenge. And I've started playing the Les Paul in that band. What okay. about that? Wow. Mm. Les Paul. Oh. I've never seen so you with a that. Les Paul. <laughs> Oh, that's right. I know. So uh, I was playing my dad last in that band, and one day we thought, well, you know what? Really, you've got the right guitar for this band? And the last gig we did was in Norway last year, I guess it was. You know, the end of last year, we did a gig in Norway at a little festival, and uh, I played the whole gig using the Les Paul. I've never done that before, which was kind of kind of a fascinating thing. Mm. And they're heavy, anyway, they're heavy too, aren't they? Like they're a heavy yeah, ha- handling yeah. guitar. Yeah. Uh, you can't sit down with them because of the balance of the slip off your knee. Yeah. You can't stand up with them because they break your shoulder. So I don't know. I mean, <laughs> they sound great, but uh, they're sort of when you're after a strat or a jazz master, they just kind of snug fit. You know, mm. the Les Paul's a difficult guitar, I think, for uh, for a guitar a guitarist like me who played rhythm backers and fenders mainly. 
yeah, it's kind of awkward. Awkward. Um, so that's anecdotal. But the last thing I should tell you about, uh, the last thing I should tell you about, which is really more interesting than you can, I don't know, it's just really great. I'm working on an album with Jerome Prosa from Tangerine Dream. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. He, is, he was the son of Edgar Prosa, the main man in, in, in um, Tangerine Dream. Yes. And he was... Jerome was in Tangerine Dream for 15 years. Yeah. And um, he was a bit of a fan of the X band, and I met him once in Berlin when we played there. And uh, at some point recently, we got in touch, and uh, I went. I said to him, well, you know, Jerome, let's get together and do something. So we, we, we uh, Olivia and I, we were in Germany already. We got the bus to Berlin from Cologne, where, near where Olivia lived. And um, I went into the studio with Jerome and we sort of wrote a whole lot of stuff. And um, we've been sending it backwards and forwards to each other. Uh, we would have worked more closely together, obviously, if the virus thing that hadn't been going on. But we've actually finished now. It's now, I've done, uh, what it's going to be is one side of the record is going to be a 21-minute instrumental track. Love it. Yeah, and yep. side two of the record is going to be two vocal tracks, okay. um, which I'm singing obviously, and um, two, you know, two sort of longish vocal tracks with instrumental sections. One's like about six or seven minutes, one's about ten or twelve minutes or something. And that's going to be the record. But Jerome now has all the vocals are done. Uh, I played the bass on it. I played the guitars on it, and he's now going to manipulate it with his tricky studio hands and uh, we're going to have a super cool uh, super cool um, I don't know how to explain it really. it's like it's, the instrumental track it's like it's like really modern you know it's like you know Atlantean Club is instrumental but it's kind of it's not modern in the same way as this as this um, Jerome and the record is um, so that's going to be really interesting <laughs> when people get hold of that and that'll and, be released uh, next year. A, yeah, well, yeah. you know that we hope so. You know that mm. that's going to be coming out when you know Jerome is is, uh, is I guess he's working on it here and there, and he's doing his best to uh, find the time to work on it. And I think he's kind of pretty free at the moment and free to work on it. I think he is actually working on it at the moment. Right. So hopefully he'll uh, he'll get it uh, get it done sooner rather than later, and then we'll once we. have sent it backwards and forth to each other and make sure that we like what we're doing conceptually and mix-wise and style-wise and part-wise, you know, we, we will, uh, we'll sort of like start thinking about album covers and band names and all that kind of stuff and hopefully get it released sometime next year. One, one hope, we'll see. You never know what's going to happen. Is it Tomorrow's a mystery. Virus? Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow is a real mystery. These yeah, days. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. But, um, you know, anyway, if people ever want to know what's going on in my life, you know, I write a blog every day. Yes. So, you know, you can always just, if you want to know what's going on with uh, my musical projects or even what I'm doing for breakfast tomorrow morning, <laughs> you can um, you just go to my website and I've written a blog every day since January. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, you can check in there. And the website uh, address is just martywilsonpiper.com or Olivia and martywilsonpiper.com? No, it's, it's martywilson-piper.com. Got it. Yeah. What? And Wilson, of course, Wilson's got two L's. Two L's, yep, yep. Um, yep. martywilson-piper.com. And the Indie Music Archive site is indiemusicarchive.net. Excellent. So you can see, you know, what that's all about there as well. Um, so, um, you know, I guess that's about it. I mean, I'm sure there's something else I'm working on I haven't told you. Oh, yeah, well, this Salim Norala's album, which I produced in Texas last year, uh, that's coming out next year at some point. I also played guitar on that. He's a singer-songwriter from, from, from Dallas in Texas. Yep. I'm working on that, uh, record on the mixes of that at the moment. He's mixing it there and he's sending 
tracks for me to listen to. But uh, we went to Texas, Dallas for three months or something, and uh, worked on a record there with him. So, uh, you know, I'm always trying to get involved in any kind of project which I like the people and I like the music. Yes. And, you know, and it's in some obscure place. You know, going to Stockholm to work with Nico or going to um, uh, Moats or going to Penzance to work with Dare on Nocturum or going to Berlin to work with Jerome on that project or going to Dallas to work with Celine. You know, I mean great what's not to like exactly you know exactly and uh when i do the online session i have session meetings all over the world it's two or three in sydney a couple in melbourne you know all over europe all over america canada i'm speaking to people all over the world all the time it's amazing yeah well, Marty, thank you very much for joining Steve and I on Purple Haze. We, you've been very generous with your time. It's and, been a real pleasure. And uh, we look forward to talking to you at another time. Perhaps we can do a, a track by track of some of these upcoming releases next year. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, it's uh, music, music, music. But, but you know what? I mean, it, it's. Uh, I just, you know, I, I say I can talk to you for hours about, you know, the the Aldiniola Beatles tribute album. So, you know, we're up for it. <laughs> I, I haven't worked for six months, so I've got plenty of time on my hands. <laughs> the, the piggy bank's running low, but anyway. Um, so, hey, Marty, I'm doing. Um, I never thought I'd be doing this, but Tuesday and Thursday for four hours, I do uh, on air. Uh, which is not music, which is talk back interviews and and music, but um, yeah, for, uh, that that sort of takes <laughs> that sort of takes it out of you. But I, we 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 enjoy doing Purple Haze, and it's a a program uh, that you know we're we're um, we take very seriously, and we just you know we like to um, respect the artist and get and get their music out to their to their audience and others. So yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, yeah. Really, I really appreciate uh, your interest and, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure. I've been thinking, I've been wondering, I've been moving, I've been calling all the time through the ride. I've been traveling, I've been flying, I've been dreaming, I've been crying through the waves in the cave. Give me